All right, let's get started. Uh, the next uh, keynote speaker is uh, Kate Soper, a uh, British Emeritus Professor of Philosophy, currently at the University of Brighton. Formerly attached to the University of Brighton. Her work has focused on feminism, the environment and theories of need and consumption. Her most important works include What is Nature, Culture, Politics and the Non-Human, and the Politics and Pleasures of Consuming Differently. Her keynote address is titled Climate Change, Work and Beyond, and will touch on the current job loss and disaffection with work and on the form that a more benign post-work order might take. She will defend the potential of a less techno-driven and intensive work culture for introducing more fulfilling ways of living, developing new skills and reinstating some earlier ways of doing and making. Um, her keynote will be followed by a short conversation with uh, Jens Holm over there, who is a member of the Swedish Parliament for Vänsterpartiet. He is chair of the Parliamentary Committee on Transport and Communications and is in charge of climate policy on behalf of Vänsterpartiet in Parliament. He's also, also the author of Om inte vi vem, if not us then who, or who, uh, which deals with the left and the climate. Uh, and afterwards, of course, we'll try to have some time for uh, questions from the audience, uh, and uh, both uh, Jens and uh, Kate will uh, uh, try to answer them. Uh, yeah, so, uh, an applause for uh, Kate. He didn't switch it on. He said, is this all right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Um, thanks for coming out. Uh, thank you, Marnie. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I was here at your conference three years ago, I think now, and it's great to be back and, um, and to see so many people come out as well. Extraordinary, you know. Um, this is sort of follows quite nicely on from Aaron Bastani's excellent address earlier. And although I think some people were hoping we might have a sort of a bit of a boxing match, as it were, uh, I, I think that that is not actually necessarily the case. I think, as you'll see, there are quite a lot of areas of overlap, but there's also, uh, admittedly, some differences. But I do actually agree with his um, analysis, really, of our crisis, and I think it is. It's abundantly clear, I think, to all of us um, that capitalist globalisation with its profit-driven growth is a key factor precipitating um, environmental collapse. It's also becoming ever clearer that new technology cannot adequately check emissions. The well-being, indeed the very survival of future generations and other planetary life, depends now on the speed and extent to which economies built around productivity and the expansion of consumption concede to a less work-dominated and more reproductive way of living. To a non-growth economy rooted in very different conceptions of prosperity and human well-being. In defence of this view, I begin here uh, by reviewing some major sources. Oh, sorry, this has gone backwards. Sorry, did they uh, some reason be? Let's go. There we are. Sorry. Um, I begin, I'm going to begin by reviewing some major sources of job loss and disaffection with work, work understood as paid employment, notably automation, and their implications for changes to the work world and the so-called work-life balance in the future. I then consider the possible reactions to the freeing up of time that automation may bring and present what I call an alternative hedonist case, a different conception of pleasure, for viewing it not as crisis but as an opportunity to move from a work-rooted understanding of identity, purpose and self-fulfillment to one that is life-centred and revolves around self-chosen ways of spending time and energy. I contrast this alternative hedonist approach with that of some recent writers on the left 
who trust to digital technology and automation to allow us to continue with what I see as a more conventionally consumerist lifestyle. And I defend it as a, as a more compelling political imaginary with which to confront the demands of climate change. I also draw attention to the difficulties besetting any move in this direction and the policy decisions it would incur. If this move is to involve the payment to all citizens of some kind of UBI, um, unconditional on work, as recommended by most of its advocates, what are the implications for the way society will organise and distribute paid work? What will be the impact of an extensive turn to more autonomy on how we spend our increased free time and on the performance of the tasks on which the successful reproduction of a complex industrialised society depends? I argue that society is committed to reduced work and greater equality in its distribution and to providing a citizen's income of some kind will be in a better position to confront and successfully resolve these difficult problems than one committed to the work ethic and growth economics. In my final section, I present the alternative hedonist approach as allowing us to engage in hybrid forms of production using advanced green technologies of the kind Bastani was talking about in medicine and so on, alongside older ways of doing and making. Counter to their usual dismissal by Marxist cultural critics, I present an extension of craft methods of working as a possible contribution to this. But I want to begin with what I call some thoughts on the troubled work world. It's widely recognised, and again, Bastani was talking about this, that the availability of the kind of work in heavy industry and manufacturing once central in core economies has for some time now been under threat, and for two main reasons. The more significant of these until recently has been the outsourcing of such work to the peripheral economies, especially China, which now play the dominant role in producing stuff for first world countries. But digital technology and automation are also now displacing human labour everywhere at a growing rate. It should be said that although these trends are powerful, <laughs> employment levels currently remain high. Jobs are still there and are still being created, especially in the service industries. There's also a continued and even intensified emphasis on the centrality of work, which defenders of neoliberalism view as a loan providing entitlement to social goods. But the tendency for jobs to be eliminated, um, if it is as powerful, and ineluctable, as Jeremy Rifkin, Paul Mason, and several others have argued, this is a slide here with some of their work, if it's, as, if it's as unavoidable as they argue, it's a major problem for capitalism itself. Both because of the social unrest, unemployment and genders, and because the way it has been the means by which consumers acquire purchasing power. The pressures of, t of new technology also make the old left <coughs> jobs through growth remedies pursued by, in the past, at any rate, by Bernie Sanders in the US and some parts of the European left um, today, unconvincing. In both neoliberal and old left approaches, the sustaining of employment over time is dependent on continuous economic growth. But the endless pursuit of growth is incompatible with the actions needed to counter environmental disaster. Business as usual is, in this sense, no longer really an option, certainly not in the longer term. Work, moreover, is now not only becoming scarcer, but provides ever fewer workers with a social identity and lifelong income, which many in the affluent world could once take for granted. Numerous studies published over the last two decades, I'll give you a few there, show too that it's, the work is becoming <laughs> increasingly uncongenial uh, for many of those who do have jobs. Even the more privileged higher earners feel the pressures of the 24-7 work culture 
and its technically driven confusion of the work and leisure boundary. There is also, as David Graeber has persuasively claimed, a widespread tacit acknowledgement that their jobs are bullshit <laughs> on the part of those working in financial services and the vastly expanded administrative sector of things like corporate law, academic and health administration, human resources, public relations and the like. Graeber writes, huge swathes of people in Europe and North America in particular spend their entire working lives performing tasks they scarcely believe really need to be performed. The moral and spiritual damage that comes from the situation is profound. It is a scar across our collective soul, yet virtually no one talks about it. Freelance workers, even well-paid ones, can be numbered among the ever-increasing ranks of the precariat for whom instability and insecurity of employment have become the norm. The recent work of Guy Standing has tracked the development of this pre precarious, a new class, he argues, which consists of millions of people in every advanced industrial country <coughs> and in emerging market economies as well, and which is being forced to accept and is being habituated to a life of unstable labour through temporary work assignments, casualisation, agency labour, tasking in internet-based platform capital, flexible scheduling, on-call and zero-hours contracts, and so on. Even more important is that those in the precariat have no occupational narrative or identity, no sense of themselves as having a career trajectory. The less well-paid workers in this sector are especially threatened by automation. The average Amazon package now takes up no more than one minute of human labour. Here you can see very few workers. Um, the company, meanwhile, has been accused of treating its human staff like robots. One woman worker reported that while pregnant, she was put to stand 10 hours without a chair. Elsewhere, it can be even worse. In the US, there are poultry workers required to wear diapers as they are not allowed toilet breaks. This kind of work can obviously offer little as a source of meaning or pride, especially when, as Standing points out, the workers' level of education often exceeds what is required for the jobs they can find. <coughs> The resentment and frustration felt by people trapped in such employment may, in fact it clearly has, attracted them to the politicians of the new nationalist right, a point we were discussing earlier this morning. In other settings, other kinds of pressure are brought to bear, where less formally hierarchical workplace relations have been introduced. They have often gone along with new forms of corporatist pressure and humiliating expectations of loyalty. So-called effective labour is now routinely requested of retail and service industry workers. Paul Maersgoff has documented uh, how candidates for jobs at the Pret-a-Manger change uh, must show a natural flair for the prep behaviours. These are listed on the website. Amongst them, uh, the things they don't want to see is that someone is moody or bad tempered, annoys people, overcomplicates ideas, or, <laughs> this is the best, it's just here for the money. <laughs> the sort of things um, they do want to see are that you can work at pace, create a sense of fun, and are genuinely friendly. <laughs> so put on a friendly <laughs> face. The threat perfect worker never gives up goes out of their way to be helpful and has presence, whatever that means. After a day's trial, unbelievable, this bit, your fellow workers vote on how well you fit the profile. Excessive work uh, makes for reliance on marketised provision of domestic and care services, propping up the compensatory dynamic of a consumer culture that profits now from the commodification of such services in order to make up for what has been lost 
through overwork. We can't do things for ourselves any longer. We have to buy the products. And it tends, therefore, to reinforce the traditional gender division of labour. Time, scarcity and the sense of being dominated by the demands of the workplace are also a constraint on personal liberty. The more caught up you are in work, the less time you have to envisage, let alone act on, alternative ways of living, or to acquire insight upon, or formulate political resistance to the existing system. So, the, what I'm saying here is that the methods by which the work and spend culture drives growth, devastates the environment, and perpetuates inequalities of income, education, and cultural capital, also help to secure it against political subversion. Those suffering most from time scarcity are unlikely to be spearheading the revolution against the work practices that create it. But, if the contradictions of the work world are coming to a head and will never again be resolvable by strategies on production and employment that did service in the past, then questions are raised, difficult ones but overdue, about how to manage a situation in which new forms of disenchantment with what is provided in the way of work and growing ethical concerns about its impact on the planet and the stuff it creates are going together with the elimination of work itself. And these questions draw us into further ones about how we conceive the purposes of productivity and about the definition of human prosperity. So now I want to move on to consider the, the form in which work might evolve in a so-called post-work uh, society. And this means moving into a more prospective and inquiring register. And I want to argue here uh, that the probable future scarcity of work, though many no doubt regard it as a major crisis in the making, might be more helpfully viewed as an opportunity. And here I do agree with Bastani. We both see this as a way of thinking about the future in a creative way. It might be better you viewed as an opportunity uh, to replace a work-centred with a more relaxed and sustainable existence. John Maynard Keynes, in his 1930s essay, which some of you may know, oops, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, leave that. It's all right. Um, I, I thought I had a sign, but I... Um, his, his essay was on the economic possibilities for our grandchildren, and he predicted that by 2030, which we're rapidly approaching, of course, we could be working as little as 15 hours per week. The problem of scarcity, Keynes argued, would by then have been resolved and man could instead address the deeper problem, as he put it, of how to use man, I'm afraid, yeah, of how to use his freedom from pressing economic cares, how to occupy the leisure which science and compound interest will have won for him, to live wisely, agreeably and well. A more recent economist, Juliet Shaw, offered in her 1991 book, The Overworked America, the most dramatic illustration of the scale of the sacrifice of potential free time since Keynes was writing. She argued, what's happened to we've got all that, never mind. She argued that um, since 1948, productivity has failed to rise in only five years. I'm going on. Here we are, there's Keynes's quote. And this is Juliet Shaw. Since 1948, productivity has failed to rise in only five years. The level of productivity of the US worker has more than doubled. In other words, we could now produce our 1948 standard of living, measured in terms of marketed goods and services, in less than half the time it took in that year. We actually could have chosen the four-hour day, or a working year of six months, or every worker in the United States could now be taking every other work year 
every other year off from work with pay. Incredible as it may sound, this is just the simple arithmetic of productivity growth in operation. In fact, uh, what has happened in the US, where, as elsewhere, any political choice in the matter was ruled out by the dictates of the economy, was that free time had fallen by nearly 40% since 1973. Although the average American by 1990 owned and consumed more than twice as much as in 1948, they also had considerably less free time. We can only guess how much free time might, in principle, have been released in the 30 years since Shaw's calculation, and how much of that has gone into production of articles of consumption instead. Although we do know that one in 10 households in the, Uni in the United States now uh, rent storage space for their excess clutter. There are reasons, of course, for this kind of lost opportunity. The most important being the power of the captains of industry wanting to keep on profiting from business as usual. But there's also the fear of workers facing a future without the structuring of time and, in some jobs, the sense of purpose provided by paid employment. For individual employees, there's the question of whether reduced working hours will entail loss of income. And for society as a whole, the question of how to provide economically and politically for a society of reduced work. There may also be general uncertainty about the still relatively unexplored deeper question that Keynes raises. How would we most wisely and agreeably make use of this time. And on these sort of questions, I submit that there are essentially two kinds of responses on the left at the present time. The one that we've heard something of, although I'm not going to refer to Bastani directly here, which I would call the technological utopia, and the one that I want to suggest can go under the broad name of the alternative hedonist approach. And I think the essential difference here is that the tech utopians trust to digital technology and automation both to cut out the drudgery they associate with almost all forms of caring and provisioning work and to deliver an abundance of goods largely of the, of the kind we already consume. Their post-work future is conceived as greener thanks to smart energy and more idle, thanks to robots and drones doing most things for us. But it is still, in essence, consumerist, in that much of its pleasure is tied to the acquisition of u and use of machines and high-tech um, high gadgetry. Alternative hedonism, in contrast, does not aspire to dispense... There's another quote for you from a couple of thinkers along these lines. Alternative hedonism, in contrast, does not aspire to dispense with humanly performed work altogether, nor think that would be desirable, even if it were possible. I share the view of André Gortz that in a society dedicated to making labour more satisfying and less onerous, the need would remain for a good deal of heterogeneous work. By that he meant work to meet social and community needs, organised in ways that may not offer the worker much control over the labour process or provide much intrinsic satisfaction. So all of us would do some heteronymous work in Gortz's future, alongside having much more free time. An alternative hedonist would certainly welcome the role of automation and green technologies in making free time more available, but need not accept that <coughs> domestic and caring tasks, the work of running a house and especially looking after children and tending to the less fit and able are just a drain on time, to be handed over 
wherever feasible to automated systems. An alternative hedonist perspective would also question the desirability of extensive commodification. These are a few more drones for you. And advocates a mode of living that would allow for more self-provisioning and autonomous activity. The aim, in a more conceptual sense, is to replace a work-centred understanding of prosperity and individual worth with one centred on engagement in intrinsically valuable activities that don't have any economic purpose, measure or outcome. From, the point of view, from that point of view, more free time would have multiple benefits, few of which would involve robotic dependence. On the contrary, once released from the worst constraints of the work world, people would take pleasure in doing things for themselves, alone or with friends and relatives, and hopefully find mundane activities such as gardening, cooking, sewing, mending, even cleaning, more rewarding. David Frame's study of the reactions of those who have voluntarily rejected work show how far this might be the case. Here are a few quotes from the interviewees in his study. Um, one of them claims a career is just one sort of job, plugged into another job, plugged into another job. And if you don't really know why you're doing it all, not to know is, is to admit that you're wasting your life. You come home feeling rubbish and you buy a takeaway then, don't you? You're too tired to cook and, then co and that costs you 15 quid and you've got to earn the money to pay for it. It's a big cycle. For me, it feels massively indulgent. This is from somebody else who's voluntarily given up work. I think I have more, but more of different sorts of things. Like when I talk to my friends in London, they're all knackered and working really long hours and haven't got time to have a chat on the phone. And I just think, God, you know, that's the lifestyle that feels self-hating and puritanical. And in Frame's own summation of his findings about his interviewees, he says, resisting capitalism's constant implications to feel ashamed and dissatisfied with their possessions, they took pride in their ability to develop their own ideas of pleasure, beauty, sufficiency and well-being. They were reflecting <coughs> on the relationship between well-being and commodity consumption, and discovering a new sense of mastery and rootedness in the world as they developed their hitherto undiscovered <coughs> capacities for self-reliance. Whilst it would be absolutely blinkered to deny that the escape to a slower pace of life is a practical impossibility for many people who would not be able to survive economically, it is equally reckless to accept the idea <coughs> that high consumption lifestyles are the fixed norm to which everyone should aspire. <coughs> Alternative pleasures of the kind welcomed by participants in Frame's study hardly feature in any of the accounts of a tech-driven post-capitalism, which subscribe to current norms of what consumers <coughs> want and why. Abundance <coughs> is viewed as enabling more of the current <coughs> lifestyle to be provided more equally and economically, <coughs> with technology yoke to ensuring environmentally preferable and cheaper to the user modes of what we already do. Thus, in many of the arguments, self-driving cars, for example, are welcomed. But the needs and more environmentally benign practices of cyclists and pedestrians tend to get overlooked. And the car culture continues, and so too does the enormous drain on resources just in the creating even of electric cars. In recommending a fascination with space travel and all the, I quote, traditional touchstones of science fiction for the way they can feed a utopian imaginary beyond the profit motive, the authors of a book towards uh, imagining the future appear surprisingly unaware of how conventional and banal 
and environmentally unsound. And boy, these astronomical fantasies can seem uh, these days. These are space travel. Um, sorry. Uh, imagery for the future. The tendency then of the tech utopians is often to welcome the collapse of the capitalist economy while accepting the legacy of its lifestyle as if it were a largely unchallengeable heritage. Moreover, what is said about the ecologically benign resourcing of their internet-based economies of abundance is not entirely convincing. Um, power consumption in the AI sector is expected to triple in the next five years as more people come online. And as the Internet of Things, with its driverless cars and robots and video surveillance machines, grows exponentially in the core countries. Also, by 2020, information and communications technology will be creating it is estimated up to 3.5 of global emissions, surpassing aviation and shipping, and possibly up to 14% by 2040, around which would be equal to the, what the US currently emits overall. Of course, uh, defendants of the informatics utopia will premise their claims for the future on massive improvements in power saving and a total conversion to renewables. And in a best case scenario, some researchers believe such improvements might happen. But on present trends, that defence looks quite wishful. And let us add to it that it also seems troublingly indifferent to the impact of the mountains of e-waste already exported to poorer countries. Since China, which previously recycled some 70% of this, has now refused to take more, some 50 million tonnes of e-waste from the EU alone has been flooding into Southeast Asia to be disassembled and recycled by those working for a pittance in the dangerous and often semi-legal conditions of salvage capital. This gives you some idea of the export of e-waste. A few images. Children working. E-waste. So, uh, what I'm saying is, what, you know, one can only really speculate on what the tech utopians might have to offer as a way of preempting what would otherwise seem a massive growth in this form of toxic waste. Now I want to move on to um, the section I suggested I would, uh, in which I would look at the idea of the funding and organisation and citizenship implications um, of moving to a post-work future. Even if the idea of working less is still perceived as threatening by both employers and employees, significant progress in that direction has already been made. And it's now being taken seriously, you know, the reduction of work is now being taken seriously by green and left-leaning political parties. Reduced work patterns are also now popular with some employers, although, admittedly, primarily on the grounds that the shorter working week will reduce unemployment and has been shown to improve rather than distrain on productivity. <coughs> the tension between commercial justifications for endorsing reduced work and those appealing to the ecological rationale and or personal benefits of a more leisured existence are reflected in differing conceptions of the universal basic income. Uh, a couple of slides on UBI, <coughs> which in a what you know, which in a post-work society would need to complement 
and might eventually replace the weight. Although there are now many UBI pilot schemes, and I'm sure some of you are aware of them, and a growing interest in them across the political spectrum, there are also concerns on the left that it might be used by a right-wing administration to accelerate state withdrawal from welfare funding and foster more privatisation of services. There is also a concern that if UBI is viewed as remuneration for the crucial contribution that time spent outside paid work contributes to productivity, then it legitimises rather than challenges the sense of life as given over to economic valorisation. Similar considerations apply to the level at which the income must be set if it is to be more than a supplement to paid work. Widely advocated as a step towards an emancipated post-work society, UBI might also be designed as a means for the capitalist order to manage the challenges that the crisis of wage work poses for capitalism itself. The underlying tension is addressed by Jan Moulier Boutin, who argues that while guaranteed social income, which is his preferred term for UBI, can be decried as merely reformist, it might be implemented in ways that enable the transition to a post capitalist society. So he argues that any society making unconditional UBI available. Would, be, would presumably be aiming at this transition to post-capitalism and would therefore also be facing pressing questions about the principles governing the extent, distribution and financing of paid heteronymous work and about the contribution of the voluntary sector to social reproduction. Although such a society will be freeing itself from dependency on market provision for many aspects of daily consumption and would probably sustain more collaborative and collective living arrangements and enjoy more voluntary services rendered by citizens, it would still depend on heteronymous labour for infrastructure, utilities, transport, some aspects of health and social care and much else. Incentives of one kind or another might still be necessary to secure continuous employment in the less attractive areas of the economy. Now, I readily admit here that this is no more than the barest sketch of the problems that a post-work, UBI-funded society in transition is likely to confront. In a post-work society, these questions would be addressed, I think, by intellectuals and civil servants who would also have to conceive ways of managing the transition from the fiction of money as owned by banks and private investors to the recognition, which UBI begins to make, that it's the property of societies and citizens. These challenges are far from easy to resolve intellectually or politically. But it would be a form of political emancipation even to confront them. As suggested in my opening remarks, a society in that position is better placed to resolve them than one clinging to work ethic priorities and seeking to manage inequalities in wealth, in opportunities and in jobs and job satisfaction through growth and technical fixes of a kind that are likely to become increasingly difficult to sustain. Finally, um, let me just now move on to, um, to say something briefly about this idea of slower working and the introduction of maybe more hybrid methods of working, combining high-tech with very low-tech, if you like, or craft, artisanal um, ways of working. As I've already acknowledged, um, collaborate, uh, collaborative internet production will have an important role to play in a less work-centred society, as too will green technologies, especially in providing renewable energy and when brought under more local and democratic control. 
The greening of technologies used in such key areas as medicine, building, transport, closing in, and agriculture will also be a priority. But to acknowledge the future role of smart systems is not to suppose that it's possible or desirable for them to supplant all forms of human labour. On the contrary, a post-capitalist order freed from the dictate of the law of value might, for the first time in history, allow us to avoid what I would call a chronocentric obsession with staying and thinking only within the parameters of our present modernity and allow previously implausible hybrid conceptions of social relations and political economy. In other words, state-of-the-art energy and medical technologies going together um, with minimal heteronymous work, the end of any gender division of labour and low material throughput and consumption. A less intensive work culture might also provide more fulfilling forms of work, developing new skills and reinstating some earlier ways of producing and providing. These could avoid the social and sexual exploitations of the labour process of earlier communities while preserving their more congenial aspects. And here, you know, I have in mind especially craft ways of working, which by reason of their emphasis on skill, attention to detail, and personal involvement and control, run counter to prevailing views on the mental manual division of labour and the timeline imperatives of the work and spend economy. In a slower paced society in which people have more time to provide for themselves, artisan expansion could expand and many more could benefit from the skills, the concentration in work and the self-fulfillment it can provide. Obviously, in arguing this, I accept that we can't be entirely nostalgic for earlier craft-based modes of producing. That's very problematic. Um, I absolutely think that the left, in introducing any kind of pro-argument around craft, has to um, avoid what Adorno, for example, dismissed as the retrospective infatuation with the aura of the socially doomed craftsman. And even less can it endorse the sort of nationalistic folk nostalgia that Heidegger succumbed to in developing his critique of technology. So, no, not, we're not going down that road. If, but if contemporary overdevelopment prompts us to consider the progressive potential of past ways of making things, we must do so without forgetting the social and sexual exploitations involved. And I am suggesting that artisanal ways of working might be reclaimed as a component of an avant-garde, post-consumerist political imaginary rather than dismissed for their association with pre-modern social relations and limits on pleasure. We're talking here, in other words, of cutting the link between progress and economic expansion without falling into cultural regression and social conservatism. <coughs> But since the continuing pursuit of economic growth threatens to bring environmental disaster, it's timely also to emphasise the constraints on personal pleasure and fulfilment in and out of the workplace imposed by the drive to produce ever more commodities. The artisan ethos has an obvious affinity with newly emerging anti-consumerist trends and networks, with the new interest in slow living, that is being registered in the USA and in Europe, and with the formation of campaigning networks linking those who have opted for downshifting and more sustainable lifestyles. And uh, just being really to some final points, I mean, I'm not claiming here that the alternative values expressed in these communities have yet made much headway against the dominant ethos of work. But I am suggesting that Marxist critics of globalisation might want to reconsider their repudiation of all William Morris-type <coughs> ideas in their thinking about the ideal future forms of time expenditure and labour organisation, and to acknowledge the unspoken, one might even say currently suppressed, affinities um, with <coughs> what art has been said to intimate for the form of labour process in a society freed of the value form of capitalism, 
and what craft ways of working may have to tell us about the possible realisation of that utopian goal. And this is actually, my position here is uh, quite in line with a point made by Juliet Shaw in her recent work on culture, <coughs> where she defends her view of, against business as usual, a view of plenitude against business as usual, uh, arguing that we're circling back and plenitude is a synthesis of the pre and post modern from the former it borrows the vision of skilled artisans producing for their own use, as well as for the market. From the postmodern period comes advanced technology and smart, ecologically parsimonious design. It's the perfect synthesis. Technology obviates the arduous and back-breaking labour of the pre-industrial. Artisan labour avoids the alienation of the postmodern factory and office. So I think in this context, um, eco-socialists and Marxists should press for a debate on the good life and argue the need for the labour movement to reframe their short-term economic goals and environmental policies in ways consistent in the longer term with a vision of the future of work, consumption and human satisfaction no longer dependent on continuous growth. Historians, political commentators and campaigners in the Marxist tradition need to complement their powerful analyses of capitalist exploitation and environmental devastation with comparable attention to the possible lines of renewal. They need to say more about the alternative political economy and about the new ways of ordering relations between humans and nature, whose necessity is implied by their critiques. And I think they also need to be more vocal about the extent to which a technology-driven way of life has become the prime means of maintaining the global reach and command of corporate power at the expense of the health and well-being of both the planet and most of its inhabitants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, please have a seat so we can... Sit down. Yeah, yeah. Just get a table. We'll have a uh, Member of Parliament, uh, Jens Holm, uh, question uh, Kate for a couple of minutes, roughly 15 minutes or so, and then we'll turn over to the audience for questions as well. And, uh, Jens will also <laughs> questions and answers. Is that you? Is that some? Is that falling off me? Is that me? No. Am I okay? We, we hear you. So. <laughs> right. Okay. Should be all right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kate. Uh, extremely uh, interesting, and uh, different uh, approach to uh, our challenges uh, compared to the previous um, presentation. Of course, uh, both uh, extremely valuable for us uh, in the left. Um, I would like to start start off with the issue of uh, of work. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the productivity has been enormous. Uh, we do not need to work as much today uh, as we used to do in order to produce what uh, what we need. Uh, still, we have a huge problem with the work-life balance, uh, as you mentioned. People feel stressed, people feel that they, they work uh, extremely a lot. And uh, you also add the, the aspect of consumption to this, and consumption, private consumption, means uh, emissions, uh, greenhouse uh, emissions. For instance, here in Sweden, if we were to include the the emissions from the consumption sector, the emissions that take place in China, India, elsewhere, in order to produce computers, mobile phones, etc., our emissions would be twice as high as they are actually are reported to the uh, United Nations statistics. And um, I think it's very interesting that you touch up on these two uh, left responses that we could have, uh, either the high-tech uh, utopia, uh, which we have heard about, and uh, your 
uh, response, uh, the alternative, uh, alternative hedonist uh, response. And uh, I would like to, s to start with the issue of uh, working time. Uh, you mentioned the uh, universal uh, basic uh, income as uh, one way forward, but if you could elaborate a little bit more, uh, where do you see the most, uh, the, for the left, the most valuable uh, projects of a sh uh, shorted working time uh, in the world today? Uh, is that the universal basic income or is it just a general reduction of the working week or what do you see? I, th I think importantly the left needs to challenge a somewhat reductive view of the UBI and of the arguments that are currently put forward um, for its implementation on in parts of the left of course. I, I think it needs to be better presented as something that is there for two main reasons. One actually is that if we don't work, that we need to cut back on productivity, really. I mean, that yes, we need to meet needs, of course we do. And um, we need to have a, a, a viable material reproductive economy. And we need to be certain, we need to have much greater equality globally and allow the, the, the needs of the most impoverished sectors of the globe are met. So, I mean, that, that from where I'm coming on the alternative humanist position goes without saying. <coughs> but there's an awful, I mean, the, the way that, the way in which we have gone on working way beyond our needs in the affluent, more developed societies um, is one which is driven by a capitalist need to accumulate profit. And therefore, you can only do that by putting, by basically incorporating more labour time, your, you know, your labour time into either goods or services and selling them. And much of it, I mean, is obviously redundant, really, to a decent way of living. Indeed, increasingly, there is an argument which is better developed by me elsewhere in my argument around alternative hedonism than what I've said today arguing that there's a growing disaffection with the downsides of consumerism, that the car congestion, the obesity, the various other forms of ill health, the stress at work. The, so in lots of ways, what, what we're getting is a so-called consumer culture which is not really terribly good for us necessarily, and much of which is arguably unneeded. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of that, what we <coughs> could do is to, the, the left I'm suggesting needs to present the, the release of free time that would be possible in a post-capitalist economy as, as an opportunity for, for uh, freeing up the planet from the kinds of major stresses on it environmentally, but also for allowing us much more free time, allowing for a more, you know, leisurely existence in which people can find, the, you know, find their time again to provide the things that they often say they would like to be able to do but can't because of the pressures of the work ethic and the driven culture. So, I, you know, that's, that I think is, is an important, you know, distinction for, for the left to, to try to, to make and to resist the idea of being pulled into whether UBI does or not, not actually serve the capitalist ends of, you know, supplanting the welfare provision. I mean, I actually would argue with Aaron Bastani as well that we, of course, we want UBS. I think we want universally provided services, mm. but, but we, but also, this this UBI should fi should figure as something that is not tied to the law of value in the same way. Mm -hmm. Does that help to answer the question? Yeah, it, yeah. it has indeed. And uh, if we are to, uh, well, put it this way, uh, we live in a consumer society, people are used to, to work a lot, earn money and consume. That's basically what people do and then we get some leisure time well, that you touch up on. But yeah. what about yeah. if people want to consume a lot and they want to work a lot and, uh, and reduced working week would mean uh, 
perhaps less money in the pocket, but of course more leisure time. And to me that sounds fantastic, but what about if people prefer well, consuming instead of having relations, instead of having your craft of reason that you mentioned? Very good term, by the way. Yes, I mean, I think this is an argument that the right will always produce, is that actually people are very happy, they are acquisitive by nature, they want more and more and more stuff. I mean, I would say it's important to try to counter some of those suggestions about that acquisitive nature. I mean, firstly, we should look at the immense budgets that have to be spent on advertising. I mean, mm. the thing that corporate power most fears is the saturation of need, you know. I mean, it, it really, and it spends, it spends more, I think, on advertising, though I might I stand corrected by some of you here if I'm wrong, but I think more is spent now on persuading us to buy things than on their actual production. So, you know, clearly we need to be kind of subordinated to what is in fact a monopoly by advertising over the ideas of the good life. We have no real competition to it. It's not surprising that you know yeah. it's quite successful in getting people to think that that is the the good life. It's what you know is is it makes life worth living, but being able to buy more and more stuff. So that one argument goes in that direction, I think, against that sort of position. The other is that, you know, I mean, and as attached to that is a sense that people are being deprived of other imagery. I mean, we don't know. You know, there would be more response if we had a different material aesthetic, I mm. would say, a different aesthetic material culture, more visions of on all sorts of ways of living. But I think also, and this is also part of my argument for alternative hedonism, there is an imminent critique of um, consumer culture developing now in the form of increasing disaffection with the what I'm calling the negative byproducts of so-called affluent um, consumption. So I think people are beginning to <coughs> resent the, the, the stress, the, you know, the, the time spent working, the, um, the ill health that often attends, supposedly, you know, um, acquisitive living, the commercialization of children mm. upsets them. You know, children are being groomed now from very early on to become good shoppers, essentially. Mm. So, and so I think that, you know, there are some, there will always be some, no doubt, who will sort of want to persist in sort of defending the consumer, consumerist lifestyle for themselves. But I think we can begin to challenge even that consensus in certain ways. And importantly now in relation to climate change and ecological devastation, I do think this argument is getting, um, in, you know, it's becoming more potent to people, the arguments against massive consumption, because of real, real fears about the consequences of the way we're going on at the moment for the, the future of their own children, certainly their own grandchildren. I mean, I think there's much more panicked awareness now of how, of, of, of what dangerous times they're living in and the need to curb consumption anyway. I, I think so too, and uh, I was just playing the devil's advocate a bit. Sure. Yeah. And uh, when, uh, when I was writing my book, I uh, touched up on uh, some polls and uh, yeah, analysis on this. and uh, and. When, when they ask people what would you like to do more in, in, in life, uh, they rarely answer uh, consume more. Uh, most of the, of the people answer I would like to have more time with relations, uh, with my family, with friends and, and so on. Uh, so I think uh, it bears a lot of relevance what you say. But still, we live in a consumer society, we re reduce consumption. Uh, consumption is what makes this society go around. If we reduce consumption, well, we will have a big economic crisis. How, do, how should we handle that? So perhaps, in particular, we politicians that deal with these issues uh, on an everyday basis. Well, I mean, how we, how we handle the looming crisis of capital, if it's coming, 
um, is, is not a question simply to be addressed from the consumption end, I don't think. I mean, it seems to me what, what in a sense, almost all the, um, the presentations that I have been present at at this conference are, are sort of talking towards the necessity of a major crisis of capitalism. Mm. Do you see what I mean? I mm. mean, we want to bring it on, in a way. Um, the question is how, how, the question then remains what, what would be the mandate for the, for the transformation on that scale, for such a radical alteration politically. That is very difficult to address. I mean, presumably, I mean, for myself, I would say I'm talking about enough popular pressure to change the system enough anti-systemic feeling to allow for the emergence of political parties who would begin to think they had, if they got into power they would have a mandate for moving to initially I suppose to a much more regulated form of market economy mm -hmm. but ultimately thinking of the transition to uh, a, a degrowth um, or a much less growth-oriented way of living. But I, d I also don't think it's very easy to conceive of this as simply happening in one nation. I mean, this has to be, in some sense, uh, the, a task addressed in, in, in a transnational kind of way. Mm. Um, but in a sense, what I suppose I'm saying is I don't think this is a question just for my form of argument about post work. I think it's one that anybody who wants and feels the necessity and urgency of the transformation of the system as we have it at the moment mm. is going to have to address in some way. We're going to have to think through the the political processes that might manage that rather than create social barbarism. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. I'm a politician, uh, you're not, but uh, let's say you were a politician for one day uh, and you could take one uh, decision in order to come to grips with the uh, consumption society and uh, put society into the right path, the kind of path that you would like to, to see, uh, what would that decision be for you? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know that was going to come at me. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, are you saying, are you asking me to do this at the level of uh, uh, one decision about a form of consumption, are you talking about? Yeah, well, something like that. I, w I would like to see, uh, um, um, I suppose, very, very important to me would be to think beyond the car culture. I mean, for me, the car culture is so closely... The car associated, culture. The, the car culture, mm -hmm. so closely associated with the fossil fuel economy. Uh, the one is because I'm totally reliant on the other. That um, I would like to see some really major radical um, intervention against the use of the private motor car. Okay. Um, yeah, being the and chair of the Swedish Transport with Committee, with that's <laughs> that <laughs> would be interesting to discuss uh, further. This would, like this would need to go together with disinvestment, complete disinvestment from fossil fuels. Yeah, I see. I see uh, uh, money is uh, coming up here. Uh, just a final question before we leave the, the questions to the, to the audience. Uh, you call your uh, response an, altern an alternative hedonist response. Mm -hmm. To me, a hedonist is a person that wants to maximize fun in yeah. life, something like that. But yeah, this, this could be fun, what you have uh, described, but uh, why hedonist? Yeah, it's actually, I've never been very happy with the phrase alternative hedonism, which is a bit of a mouthful. I mean, I, what I was very... When I first started working on what I see as an emerging critique of consumerism for its downsides, I wanted to have a term that reflected the fact that when we're thinking about a post-consumerist, Consumption. We're not necessarily thinking just about belt tightening and, and negative return to an ascetic lifestyle. We're talking about another way of having pleasure. 
And so I wanted to have a, a phrase or a word or some kind of label that that grasped, that, that conveyed the way in which we're talking here about pleasure. Mm. You know, we're talking about you know the sort of pleasure you might have if you were being transported in in different kinds of ways, or we're talking about the pleasure of working less. We're talking about the pleasure of being able to do more things for yourselves. Uh, provided you've got the leisure and enough income to, to do that and so on. So it's about alternative pleasure. But it's, I'm not using it in any very, you know, technical, philosophical sense. All right. Um, so we got it clear. It's, uh, you have a vision for a much better society and uh, that's, well, I think it's that's in, why... Yeah, it's in people's self-interest. I mean, you know, people usually don't change their ways well, they're not very ready to change their ways unless they see it as at least in part in their mm. own interest. I mean, most of the left in the past or the green movement in the past has appealed to people to change their ways because of the impact on the environment or because of its social justice implications. Both those, alt both those are forms of altruism in a way. They're about, well, perhaps the environment is complicated. But I mean, my, my argument includes, alongside the benefits for the environment, alongside the uh, ways in which it's going to, to uh, begin to adjust the problems of mm. social injustice nationally and globally, it is also in your own self-interest. You could actually have a more enjoyable life in affluent culture that way. Yeah. So that, you know, that's where the hedonist thing yeah. comes in. We could create a society which is much better for us as individuals, but it will be better be for all as well, and for the planet. Yeah. That sounds good. Manny, should we leave the floor to the audience? Let's do that. Uh, let's begin on uh, this side of the aisle. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this presentation. So my question is the following. Um, part of the limitation of the craft culture and people working less is that we actually have to do a lot of intellectual organizing and productive work to get a green transition. So in British discourse, uh, partially based on the uh, Leninist discussion of new economic policy, there was a discussion about the commanding heights. So we have military industry, we have the auto industry, the oil industry, controlling the commanding heights of the economy. So isn't part of our mission to somehow gain control over the means of production, means of innovation, democratizing science and technology, so that we leverage that kind of power? And isn't there a gap between that and this kind of artisanal, non-work, uh, even this futuristic discourse, which seems to be you know, replicating the alienation from control of institutions? Um, yes, I mean it's a good question, and that, I mean I think I think you're right. There's there's definitely a big difference between the sorts of collaborative and craft-oriented ways of producing and providing uh, for oneself in a more self-reliant way, and the kinds of high-tech intellectual cognitive. Um, work that would be essential to the development of benign technologies. You know, I mean, let's say we don't want, we get past the military, but we still need a lot of high class intellectual cognitive input. You're, you're completely right, and that would be under control. I mean, I think what I was trying to sketch was that, you know, that in talking about hybrid would be that we would have both of these sorts of ways of of operating that alongside very high tech um, and very um, intellectually uh, demanding kinds of institution and, and work um, and research which would be essential to meeting the energy crisis and providing the new technologies that we're going to need to do that. You could also because you had allowed for the introduction of more free time and were no longer in all of the forms of provision dependent on, um, on the law of value operating. You could do things slowly if, to supply other kinds of goods, you know, more, more domestic kinds of services and goods and so on and so on. 
But there would be no question that we would need to have some overarching control over certain aspects of our, our institutions and, and provisioning. And I think that would be, for, for me, that would be the state. I mean, I don't see how this happens without a larger role for the state. Mm. So, yeah, let's democratise it and bring it back into public control. Um, I think if you could present yourself, perhaps would be good. Just name and if you represent something. Okay. I know uh, you do. <laughs> yeah. uh, Gabby Rebinder, and I'm a member of the board for the Green Party in Stockholm here. And um, I was just thinking about something here, and that's in order to actually achieve this uh, transformation. How do you view um, uh, the question of uh, housing? Because at least here, we have a huge housing crisis. Mm. This means that it's really hard to start reducing work hours because the demands to actually get any housing at all are ridiculous. Mm. And I think that is also tied a little bit to the car thing that you spoke about earlier as well. Yeah, because people are dependent on, be, on needing to, tr to travel by car and so on. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the housing problem is part of the system that we're inserted within and which we need to somehow begin to supplant and replace. Um, so, obviously, in a sense, what what you're, what you're saying, and I guess the housing aspect is one of the most important and difficult ones to unpick um, here, is that we, it, you know, it is very difficult to realistically think in terms of a completely different form of consumption, or even to green our consumption very dramatically, given the conditions under which you know, we have to work in order to supply even the most primary needs like shelter and food and, and transport and so on. So, I mean, by only, I know, I mean, I, I, no doubt you have some ideas maybe within the Green Party, it would be good to hear them. But uh, I mean, the, I think what we're, what we're arguing here is the importance of trying to imagine a future and developing the political economy that could be, you know, allow us to actually think beyond the present system of provision. And that would include, I presume, not necessarily being committed to private ownership of housing for everybody. I mean, there are other ways in which we can allow people to, to, to have permanent residence for life and so on. We can, we need to be a bit more you know, creative in our thinking about that and to take that, to push that as part of a programme that a potential political party or a large political parties might take on. And you, Kate, you mentioned before universal basic services and uh, isn't housing uh, the right to somewhere to live uh, should be a public yes. service? Yeah, I think so it should be provided. The more we can do to it's get the housing public. sector off the market, the better we, yeah. it would be, I would say. Yeah. I'm sure that, you know, you two are more experts on this kind of thing than I, I think. Um, hello, uh, my name is Victor Mauritz. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, I'm a part of the Littoral Collective Brand. Um, Sorry, I can't quite hear you, can you? I don't know why. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Is it on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's better. Yeah, that's on. better. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. My name is Victor Mauritz and I'm part of the Editorial Collective brand. Um, I wanted to kind of uh, go back to the, one of the questions uh, Jens asked before about um, like the, the, the fear of uh, not having anything to do in a way. Um, mm. I think uh, like it's very true as you commented, Jens, that, uh, and as you also pointed out, Kate, that one of the things people long for the most these days are 
uh, relationships. With, I mean, if we look at isolation and, and uh, social misery in that sense, that then uh, that the people are really living in in uh, really poor ways in terms of relationships and, and so on. Yet, uh, as you also pointed out before, Kate, um, we're living also in this culture that that brings about this, of course, and mm. this economy that brings about this with the commodifications of uh, relationships of care, of relationships of attachment, uh, and even the most intimate uh, parts of, of our, our being, right? So uh, my question is about, like, on a, you kind of talked about this on a policy level, like what would we need in order to, as a society, move more towards uh, the society you sketched here? But what I'm wondering is about is like, uh, what kind of movement would be needed to uh, bring this sort of, of uh, change around? Because uh, as it is now, um, it seems to me that it's just difficult for a lot of people to kind of imagine living in different ways and kind of practicing it. So. Uh, to put it in like a more of a rhetorical question, but uh, w mm. would, would there be a need for a movement that kind of opens up this imaginary in practice as well and kind of withdraws in ways from uh, present uh, consumer culture? Mm. Um, it's, that is a really interesting question and a difficult one. I mean, I, sometimes, I, sometimes I've wanted to compare the kind of movement that needs to surge around consumption um, and to draw on the kind of energies that are there for changing consumption, both the disaffection with affluent consumption, because it is there, even if it's still fairly minority, as it were, and also the panic, you know, that's driving it about the consequences environmentally if we don't change consumption. I've sometimes wanted to compare that as a, as a potential sort of wave or social movement akin to that of feminism or anti-racism or anti-colonialism, that this is the next big phase of human emancipation, as it were. You know, that, that thinking in terms of altering our consumption is something we owe, if not to ourselves, to all those who are not yet born. Because then, I mean, what kind of a life are they going to have? So if it is, you know, wrong to actually be, you know, we're, we're sort of, our, our current thinking on emancipation makes it extremely wrong to be, you know, racist or, or sexist to treat people differently in, in you know, those kinds of ways, then surely we need to sort of think in terms of the, the importance of joining in some sort of movement on behalf of the future. And I think there are embryonic elements of that now coming together through the climate strikes and through Extinction Rebellion maybe. Um, on the other hand, I don't want to, I don't think it's, going to work as a social movement if it becomes too prescriptive. So I think what you're also, you know, if there's a sort of saying, this is the right way to do it all, this is how you need to, to, to consume instead of, you know, your consumerist old ways. I think this is something that only works if people feel it in themselves and mm -hmm. come, so that in a sense it's got to come very much from within the soul of people. It's got to come, it's got to be a, a a grassroots thing has got to be felt as something that people commit to because you know they have a they have a real sense that the that, that this is going to work for them as well. And I mean I I I don't know quite how we build that, um, but I I do think the one thing that is really needs to be restored and that the parties of the left need to think about um, creating, undoing a way in which we've been treated as that even our citizenship has been taken over by the idea of the consumer. I mean, I don't know how far this is true 
in Sweden, but from the days of Thatcher onwards in the UK, there has been a total erosion of the idea that people are citizens as well as consumers. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to begin to dismantle that, that way of thinking and to point out that actually the best way of being good citizens is through our consumption, which means challenging a great deal of the commodification of our services and of ourselves and of our, our souls, if you like, of our social relations, our personal... Do you see what I'm saying here? And I'd, so, I, yes, I mean, how that comes about is difficult. But that, whether it comes about as a single movement or whether it comes around through a network of concerted, thing, concerted sorts of... Uh, a, a network of other in, you know, isolated, sort of more isolated uh, <coughs> movements around particular issues, I'm not sure. Probably both, actually, in a way. I don't, does that answer your question at all? Or help? Yeah. I mean... Um, I, I think this is not entirely a, a new uh, question. No. We've been talking about the problems with the mass consumption society for a long time, but yeah. perhaps the environmental, the cl climate crisis linked to it makes the case much stronger, much much more urgent. I would say so, yeah. And yeah. In, in so we can also wider, uh, wider the issue and we can build up a bigger support for uh, such movement. And we have, I think we have to think uh, new and more uh, creative in these times. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Marco and I study aesthetics. So, physics? Uh, no, aesthetics. So, oh, art philosophy. Mm -hmm. No, oh, aesthetics. Sorry. No, yeah. not. Uh, I agree with all the critique of consumerism, except in one thing, personally, and that is books. My, my life is uh, an ever increasing uh, wish list of books. So, I thought about that. If you think of the pursuit of knowledge as a sort of conspicuous consumption in uh, the perspective of class distinction and so on. How do you think we can approach uh, curiosity or, or like, yeah, intellectual pursuit in a non-consumerist way? Or is it, is it impossible? Uh, what? You're a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> Should have an answer. <laughs> Um, do you think we always do pursue it in an entirely consumerist kind of way? I mean... No, no, but my, I mean, what would a non-consumerist pursuit of knowledge would, it would look like? Or, what, when I hear these kinds of talks, I'm like, oh yeah, that's great, consumerism is very bad. I am going to go home and I wish I could buy all these books that she named. And what is, what is different about that? Because, because I believe, as you say, that there is something different between that and just buying a new phone because, okay, this is a newer version, I'll buy it and I'll throw the other one away. There is something immaterial about knowledge that is worthwhile. Mm. While at the same time, I believe that one could also see knowledge as a commodity and consume it in a consumerist way. So if there exists two types of consume of knowledge, how can we differentiate between them? Maybe there isn't. Maybe, it's, maybe knowledge is an exception. I don't know. Well, I think, I suppose I, I, I haven't really thought about this sort of question much because I think I've ten, tended to assume that knowledge um, is one of the things that is less, you know, is less sort of subject to that form of consumerism. Um, on the other hand, I do, I mean, if you're, I mean, the areas I've been thinking of more, I suppose, around the way in which education has become so vocationally, or, you know, that the humanities <coughs> even are dropping out of consideration and so on because of the drive to, um, to, you know, to, to present education and intellectual activity as essentially about preparing you for work and for joining the rat race and so on and so on. And this has driven out, I mean, the, the commitment in the universities and the academy um, to <coughs> humanities teaching. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of, I don't know whether it's true here in Sweden, but certainly again in the UK, it's true now that people don't want to study for the sake of studying. 
um, philosophy, history, literature, and so on, because although they like the idea of it all, it's not going to get them a job. It's not. It's useless from their career point of view. You know. So this is sort of happening. Whereas I think we need a total reversal of that kind of way of thinking about knowledge. I think that if we are going to a post-work society, um, and there are lots of reasons to think we're going to have to kind of face up to it, one way or another. I agree with Ari Bastari there, obviously. Um, when we, we need to think of preparing people to enjoy their free time more, which means providing them with a, with a different set of resources, I think, probably, intellectually, probably, than the ones they're given. So, I mean, I think if you're talking about the commercialization of culture, um, that does, is, is that partly what you're talking about? Or yeah, I think that that's one part. Yeah. The other part would be like the the implicit value of distinction in a sort in some kinds of of consumption. If you take, for example, wine, it is it is nice to know of different kinds of wine and oh, this comes from that region, this comes from that region. Yeah. And personally, I do like that. I yeah, I, I would well. like to. <laughs> it's like a, an immaterial world of knowledge and geographical interrelations and etc. Yeah. While at the same time it's very uh, embedded in the capitalist logic of distinction, class distinction. So can you get the good thing without getting the bad thing? Yeah, I would have thought so. I mean, I, I, it, it doesn't seem to me impossible that people's tastes would change, in a, you know, in any case. I mean, that... that I mean, yeah, okay, in a Bourdieu sort of way. I mean, wine belongs to the sort of middle classes and BS. But all that is, is not fixed and set, I don't think. And I've never thought of alternative hedonism as a world that was not supplying those kinds of pleasures. I mean, I think that the pleasures of knowledge and of the kind that you're talking about and, uh, and the, the pleasures of reality and so on. These, these are surely ones that we're not going to entirely need to dispense with. Um, I, I, I think you touched upon something very important and I know Mani says that we need to wrap up here, but I just would like to say that uh, innovation, uh, knowledge, uh, the best ideas, uh, I think uh, they should be shared, they should be yeah. spread, okay. and there we run into a problem with the capitalist uh, society that uh, push for more of uh, intellectual property rights, uh, copyrights, patents, uh, etc. And when it comes to the climate crisis, this is such an urgent issue because we need the latest, the best innovations, we need to spread it uh, all over. Yeah. But at the moment, it's locked in uh, in the hands of uh, some few big corporations and they want to keep, maintain their uh, te technological advantage. Uh, maybe that was, wasn't really what you asked about, but I think there is an intellectual uh, angle on the whole discussion and uh, who has the right to use our ideas, our yes, good well, I mean, thinking and so on. Yes. And I think we should be very generous in uh, spreading the I, best I ideas. Well, I agree. And also, I mean, I think in a way, techno te in a technological sense, we have the opportunity on because of the internet and yeah. digital communication actually I mean this is the sort of argument that Paul Mason has isn't it yeah. that you know the internet of things is available for everybody everybody can be an intellectual they've only got to well, Google mm -hmm. <laughs> you know I mean that's, that's the, the contradictory aspect of it is that but if this but actually there isn't a problem about sharing knowledge I mean, it's out there on the internet, it could be freely available to everybody, all yeah. of the time. But, of course, the moment it does become freely available, as you say, there are the, the, the opposition will, will try to control it and patent it. And, exactly. Know. Yeah, so, so we need to as a That's another challenge for us. That's another challenge. So thank you so much, Kate Soper, and thank you so much for all these uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you.